started. Um, I am Amy Jacobs, the Interim Commissioner for DECAL. Thank you all for being here. For those of you that are here in person and for those that are watching online, I think we have about 100 participants online, so we appreciate the response we got for y'all to come and listen as we talk to you about the world is doing with our Early Learning Challenge Grant for our youngest citizens and our youngest learners. Early Learning Challenge Grant is a great opportunity for DECAL as we continue to build that integrated system of care for our birth through five population and for those <coughs> families. And we, although we are the lead agency for the Early Learning Challenge Grant, we cannot do it without our state and local partners. And we are partnering with Department of Public Health, Department of Human Services, Department of Education. Technical College System of Georgia, Department of Economic Development, Department of Community Affairs, and if I said any, I apologize, but I'm sure you will see some of those acronyms and names in the presentations in just a few moments. We are excited about this work because it aligns directly with Governor Deal's priority of all students reading on grade level by third grade, and we know that we've got to build that foundation first, and so that's what we're here to do. Um, this is our briefing on the Early Learning Challenge Grant, and we will have many more, but in the meantime, if you want to stay up to date on what we're doing, the website, and also through social media, through our Facebook page, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, Pinterest, many, many others that I'm probably not even aware of. So um, thank you again for being here. Let me just go ahead and turn it over to Kristen Bernhard, who is Deputy Commissioner for System Reform. And she'll give you a brief overview um, and then turn it over to her team members as they talk specifically about the project. So thanks again. Amy, and thanks again for all of you for being here both in person and online. Before we get started going into the work of the Early Learning Challenge, I just want to give you a brief overview about how this presentation is going to work today. Uh, comment cards if you're sitting here in person with opportunities to write questions. We're going to hold all questions till the end, and so as you have a note, you'll write them down, and Jack, who's in the red jacket, at the end of the presentation, will be collecting them from the rows, so holding questions till the end. If you're watching online, if you could email your questions to me, kristen.bernhard at decal.ga.gov. That address will come back up at the end of the briefing. Uh, so we'll be able to address them both from those of you who are in person and who are watching online. And if we don't get to get to your question today, one of our team members will be in touch with you afterwards and we'll respond either via email or via phone to make sure that we get everything covered. So we'll go ahead and dive on in. That information on the Early Learning Challenge Grant. This was a bit that gave the opportunity for states to really think about how do we create an early learning agenda for our state? How do we build and strengthen existing systems? And the grant specifically asked states to look at how are we going to improve program quality and outcomes for young children? How are we to increase the number of children with high needs who attend high quality early learning and development programs? And as Commissioner Jacobs mentioned, how are we moving to close the achievement gap, even at a young age, to ensure that all children enter kindergarten ready to succeed? Georgia, of course, was successful in this effort. This was a great opportunity, as we mentioned, for our state. And we really looked in our application about what we could do to talk about what we've already done as a state, what we've already done to meet those goals that were outlined in the application. In Georgia, two programs really came to the top as examples of those efforts. First, of course, our Georgia Pre-K program with its over 20-year history and quality rated, which you'll hear more about as the presentation goes on. Now, we're a little competitive here at DECAL, and we were really excited when we received the second highest score among the 16 applicants for this one of the Early Learning Challenge grant. That's pretty good. Uh, we were even more excited that we received the largest dollar amount award of $51.7 million. We'll take second in score if that means we're going to be first in the dollar amount earned. So that's a great uh, example of where Georgia stands on the national stage in early learning. The Red Top Early Learning Challenge is a competitive grant, and the fact that national experts review our application and came to that conclusion that we were really at the top of the pack in both what we had done and how we plan to move this one forward is a great, uh, reflection on the work that all of you have done and that DECAL and our governor have done for many years. Next, race start. Well, the race actually began at the start of this calendar year. So time started ticking, or uh, started ticking on January 1st of 2014, and the thing ran for four years, so through the end of 2017. So when we talk about the timeline for the race, we're talking about that four-year period. 
to reference the project of the Early Learning Challenge Grant. There are actually 12 projects, but that's really more important are the five themes of the project. And these are really the items that we want to say at the end of this four years that we really move the needle across these five big themes. The first is looking at successful state systems. The Learning Challenge Grant is a system still grant. And how do we use this funding to build, as the commissioner mentioned, a system of care for our youngest learners? So the management, me and my team, sponsor that project. As we'll hear about later, the early education empowerment zones. The theme is that high quality accountable programs we want to sure children in Georgia have access to the highest quality early learning, and there are two principal projects that fall under that, looking at quality rated access and availability, and the research activities that support that. The third critical theme of Georgia's Early Learning Challenge Grant is how are we promoting early learning outcomes? And there are three projects that fell under that theme. The fourth critical theme is how are we building a great early childhood education workforce? We know that almost more than any other person, the teacher in front of that child has a critical impact on their growth and development and how to make sure they have the skills, knowledge, and abilities to be able to help children even at a very young age. And finally, the fifth critical theme, measuring outcomes and progress. After we spent $51.7 million, after we've spent four years racing to the top, how will we know that we have actually moved the needle? How will we be able to show that we've had an impact on children in Georgia and that also on our state as a whole? So those are five themes of Georgia's Race to the Top Early Learning Challenge Grant. Now, forward, you'll get a chance to hear from the project leads on each of these projects to talk in more depth about what does the work look like over the next four years. You'll be expecting to see as we move forward with implementation of this grant. I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Wood John, to talk about the Early Education Empowerment Zone. Kristen, there we go. Very good. So, um, the Education Empowerment Zone project, um, pretty exciting project, because it's a project that really takes communities and thinks of them as laboratories, laboratories in which we can think about how do we coordinate and align systems of education to support children and their families. So we think about that, um, DCAT has a, a, an idea of choosing four zones, um, geographic zones, sometimes they're one county, sometimes they're multiple counties, and have a selection process to get to those zones. These zones will have a couple of things in common. Number one, they will have high populations of high needs children. So real children are children who might be dual language learners, children with disabilities, in extreme poverty. These are also going to be areas that have community capacity. So we're looking to move into communities where they have started to move the needle, but they need infrastructure, they need support to really make the gains in their communities. And this project is a precursor to um, reducing the achievement gap. This is about reducing the opportunity gap for Georgia's youngest citizens. So how to create early learning opportunities, systems of their opportunities to the needle forward progression. What do the counties receive? So this is an important topic because they don't receive a check with money. It is not a grant opportunity. It's a community partnership opportunity. Um, and so some of the things that communities will receive is a community liaison, a coordinator who will help them align and coordinate these systems of care. They'll receive um, support home visitation services in alignment with the Great Start Georgia program. They'll receive economic development incentives. Those are incentives that will help us create the infrastructure for early care education. It might happen that we choose a zone that doesn't have high quality early care and education facilities. We may have to go in and work with our um, community development partners to build programs to push the needle um, forward. We'll also receive quality improvement grants to help raise the quality. Those will be tightly um, aligned with the quality rating and improvement systems um, incentive packages. They'll receive enhanced child care subsidy payments. Of all the, the major initiatives that this particular project holds, it is an opportunity for us to look at child care subsidy, which is, a, which is a, really a scholarship program for children with high needs, and figure out how do we make sure that we are getting closer to the true cost of quality in early care education. So there'll be three different projects around subsidy 
Pam um, is going to talk about one of them that's related to quality rated called tiered reimbursement. The higher star level in quality rated, the higher your percentage of bonus on your tiered reimbursement, um, your CAP subsidy. But we have two other subsidy projects. One will be to reduce parent copays. A parent, I choose a high quality program, I'm going to have a lower parent copay to support in making that decision. The um, subsidy grant opportunity is literally a grant, a subsidy grant. So in your brain, think about all the best things about Georgia's pre-K. Georgia's pre-K opportunity for, we're going to provide scholarships for this number of children, and in return, you provide the highest quality you can. Critical teachers, lesson plans with learning activities that align with the Georgia Early Learning and Development Standards, assessment that leads to child practice and, and teacher practice in helping children learn and grow and develop. So to commit to all these high quality initiatives in order to get the Georgia Pre-K grant. We'll have a subsidy grant. You're going to need as a program to have credential teachers aligning your curriculum with the standards, making sure you use assessment to guide practice. You're going to commit to all these high quality things and in return, you'll have a certain number of subsidy spots for your program. It helps the provider really think about that cash flow and keeping their program open and keeping children in, um, in the enrollment. Those subsidy grants. We're also going to infiltrate the zones with Georgia program for toddler care specialists, the mentors and specialists who can really help raise the quality of infant and toddler care in the zones. We'll, um, we'll fuse the zones with um, an expansion of the pre-K summer transition program, an amazing program that we know helps children be successful in kindergarten. Uh, we'll have specialized professional development aligned with our hierarchy for professional development that's proposed another project. And we will have comprehensive assessment and referral services as part of the zone project. So these packages that each zone will receive to move the needle, and then each zone will also have the freedom to talk about what they need for their specific community to move the needle. So um, a graph of the 11 potential zones. The first 11 um, zones were chosen based on quantitative data around education, poverty, the capacity for the community, um, quality, um, existing quality rated programs, um, and family characteristics. So after these um, 11 zones, now we're in a qualitative process to choose the final four zones. So to get final four zones, we're actually going into the areas and having community meetings where communities have brought all of the best thinkers around early care and education, everyone who has a stake in the game, from really cradle to workforce, um, in this um, type of initiative, and they are meeting with us to talk about what's going on in their area, the community capacity, and um, how they will benefit from being a zone. So an exciting project that we're moving forward, and a huge piece of our project is a partnership with um, Quality Rated. So I'll now introduce the Quality Rated Director, Pam Stevens. So, so excited, excuse me, to talk to you about Quality Rated today. Quality-rated is Georgia's tiered quality-rated and improvement system. Really, with quality-rated, we have one very simple goal, and that raises the quality of early care and learning in Georgia. Um, we do three things to get to that part. It's like a three-process. We assess early care and learning programs, and we do this with a portfolio that, um, where we score structural quality and not assessment using the um, environment rating scale to assess process quality in child care. Um, all those scores put together, uh, a center or a family provider achieves a star rating, one, two, or three stars, depending on their score. Before that happens, before we ever get to assessment, we have supports for just going through this process. We have um, our healthcare resource and referral agencies who offer uh, technical assistance and professional development to help people achieve the star rating that they want to achieve. We we'll communicate the level of quality to families in a child care center because we think this is a great tool for families when choosing child care programs to be able to use that star rating to know what their child experience once they once they come to child care. Um, to go through this grant, uh, to uh, increase the access and availability of quality rated in child care, and um, we want to significantly increase availability for families for children to be in child. Uh, programs. Um, 
want to significantly, significantly increase access for each and every child in Georgia. I believe that all children deserve quality care. And like Laura said, we have a special focus on children with high needs. Uh, our goals are big. We have a goal of 100% participation because if we really believe that all children deserve high quality care, that all care needs to be high quality. Our goal of increasing availability um, for high quality settings is to get centers involved with us. We do that through incentives. We have bonus packages that programs move through the quality rated process to achieve higher star ratings and also to reward them for their hard work and for their willingness to talk. We have, like I said before, technical assistance through the Child Care Resource and Referral Agency, as well as professional development that's individualized for each program. Uh, we are going to, like uh, we mentioned earlier, support families through consumer education. We want families asking for quality rated, rated programs, looking for quality rated programs. So, um, everyone, again, is in a high quality center or family care or home. Um, we also know that a lot of our early learners are in all different types of programs. You may be in a family child care home, you may be in a child care center, or you may be in Head Start, a uh, pre-K program in a public school, and that each of those programs might look a little different. And so we'll modify the quality rated process so that every should be included. Laura mentioned a big focus on children's high needs, the tiered study reimbursement that she mentioned. Which means that if a program enrolls children who receive child care subsidy, they'll be reimbursed at a higher level if they have a quality rating. And the higher the rating, the bigger the reimbursement. So we're really excited about that. Um, we large time up the um, work with tiered reimbursement and reimbursement through uh, the EZ zones, the education empowerment zones, the subsidy grants, and the tuition co pay. Um, is to improve quality of uh, care in, uh, all over the state, and we're doing that by number one, growing our child care resource referral agencies and, and their way of supporting our programs. We know that these technical assistance providers and these uh, professional development providers are the ones that are really in the centers working programs to move quality, and we're going to grow their capacity and strengthen their model. Um, we're going to expand the program for uh, infant and toddler care. That Larman, and we're going to implement a new program called QI, Quality Rated with an I. And that's for our three star highest level programs. We want to improve their inclusive practices for children with disabilities. So now I'm going to turn to Dr. Pond. <laughs> Sorry, we're used to doing this. In we're not used to doing it with web streaming, so that some of us, including myself, very nervous. So I had to make sure I was in the right, you know, proximity. Uh, first of all, thank you all for being here. I am honored to be here and even honored to be a part of this group. It's a, it's a great group of colleagues, and we've been working on a lot of this for a long time, and so it's nice to be able to share it with you. So I get to talk about research, uh, but I want you to think of this as being more than research, and it's a bigger piece than just a research study. It's beyond what we talk about when we talk about civil evaluation. It's looking at the way that we connect our research, connect our evaluation of quality rated to policy, uh, to policy issues. That is about how well does the system work, how well do all the things that we want quality rated to do. How are we doing, and are we achieving those uh, those outcomes? Uh, it's been fun for me because we were able to follow a national methodology in doing this. Actually, in uh, oops, what happened? No matter. There's a the methodology. Uh, <laughs> but we were doing validation before there was there was the val there was the validation methodology. It's been something we've been working on for a while. So this is part of the evaluation. But it's also separate from that. And again, it's that linking the research to policy. So what is a validation plan? Well, first of all, it's knowing your context and the status of your quality rating and improvement system. For Georgia, it's knowing that we just didn't wake up one day and create this quality rating and improvement system. We've this on sound research, the FPG studies 
we reference a lot that took, took place 2009, 2010, group stakeholder meetings, lots of feedback, and lots of input into that design process. So it's not just something that happened overnight. Uh, building on that, continuing to engage QR, IS stakeholders in the process. For the views who have been participating in our focus groups this past summer, you have been participating in the validation process. You are part now of this, of this project. And so that is part of what we're talking about when we mention validation. Uh, and our data infrastructure. Craig is going to talk in just a few minutes about our data and some of the things that we're doing around data in this project. But it's also looking at the data that we collect across all of our programs and how that feed into our knowledge. Uh, planning, validation, research questions, and the approach. So even though you know this is one part of the process, we also will have those larger evaluation questions. And that's part of what we're doing with validation. So in data collection, analytic approach, how are we measuring what we say we're going to measure? And then last but not least, dissemination of findings to stakeholders. And that's something we're going to be continually doing throughout the project. What does our validation look like? Well, we actually have it in three different activities. First is something that we're doing right now. So call it insurer tiers reflect differential levels of quality. So if we say something to one star or two star or three star, are there meaningful differences between those star levels? So, so that's doing some internal internal statistical analyses. Some of that being out into the field and talking and doing our focus groups and talking to providers and understanding what those different levels mean. Also includes doing focus groups with parents, other provider surveys. And just other ways that we can be out in the community understanding what quality rating means and what those different levels mean. If they say a one star, does that mean the same thing to you as it does to me, as it does to Laura, as it does to any of our stakeholders? And so that's part of what that uh, activity is. Our second one, which obviously we haven't started yet, is looking at these tiers to an external instrument of quality. So I mentioned that we use the environment rating scale in a quality rated system. Them, what that looks like if we compare that to other measures of quality that are not part of quality rated, such as the class instrument, the ELCO, some other instruments that other states are developing. Do we get the same levels of quality if we look at that comparing to those, those instruments? And this is not least the external study, and this is a piece that was prescribed in the grant, so it's not a lot of choice in doing this. But what the tiers look when we take quality across the state? I mean, have we been able to move the needle with professional development? Does quality of the state look different in 2017 than it did in 2009 when we did the FPG study? Have we been able to change that? And what's the relationship with quality rated to child outcomes? And not just looking at those levels to child outcomes, but also the specific activities in quality rated and how those relate to child outcomes. So it's a much bigger piece than just saying, oh, level one means this for children, level two means this for children. It's looked at all those different components and quality rated and connecting that back to the big picture. So as you know, as it's research and always get a lot of time, you know, in the <laughs> so, uh, I've done my two slides and now I'm going to go over to my good friend and colleague, Laura. Thank you, Laura. My 20 slides. <laughs> Four. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Laura Evans, Instructional Learning Manager here at DECAL, and I'm very excited to talk with you today about um, our early learning and development standards. Um, this, is, this section is promoting early outcomes and early learning outcomes, and you'll hear from a few of us in this area. But, um, you know, research shows one great improving early learning outcomes is by having statewide um, high-quality early learning and development standards. Um, so, in Georgia, before we started writing this grant, um, we went through a revision process and we already had a really good set of early learning and development standards. Uh, we rolled out our Georgia Early Learning and Development Standards in June of 2013 and rolling that out over the past year. So when we started uh, writing the grant, the real goal here was to continue the expansion and implementation of the project we already had, which was the GEL. Um, so, We've done great things with the gels. We wanted to do more. So part of that is um, we're going to be producing and disseminating additional print and digital resources for all of our stakeholders. Uh, one 
Um, great component of that has been we've produced some TV spots, and they're called Play to Learn. They're airing on DPB TV right now. I believe several of us have seen them on TV. It's very exciting when you see one. Um, and I'll show you one of those in just a second. We're also developing some web series that will be targeted towards popular teachers, preschool, pre-K teachers, as well as families. We're also in development of a teacher activity toolbox through the grant, which will um, just supplement some of the resources we've already done around the gels, and it will give teachers a nice resource to have in their classrooms as they're writing lesson plans and plan instruction around the gel. Um, that we're doing uh, in this area is creating a tiered professional development um, that will include opportunities for teachers, providers, and families to receive tailored um, information, training that will help them move from the knowledge level to the application level. So we've over the last year as we We've been rolling out the gels. We really got teachers with in our workforce with a solid foundation of the gels. They've got that knowledge and awareness. And what we're going to do over the next four years with the grant is move them from that knowledge to being able to apply what they know about the gels so that they really improve those child outcomes. So I see the grant gave us a great opportunity to really look at how we're approaching professional development in Georgia how we can improve that professional development system. The way that we outlined in the grant is for it to be tiered and for you to start out on that tier one, that early learning development awareness, and then move up through those tiers, um, improving your knowledge and improving your ability to apply what you know. So you can see um, a tiered type of system, it gets smaller as you go up because the number of people that move up through the tiers gets smaller. And though so that tier three and tier four is going to be your really concentrated professional development, mentoring, and coaching models. Also, in this project, we'll be partnering with World Class Instructional Design and Assessment, also known as WIDA. We love some acronyms around here, so we're adding another one to our arsenal. Um, so, WIDA Consortium, um, our K through 12 system is already a member of the WIDA Consortium. Georgia is a member of the WIDA Consortium. So, it was just a natural partnership. They are developing some really awesome resources around supporting dual language learners, and so we're partnering with them. Um, they're going to come in, do a needs assessment in Georgia, see what Georgia needs as far as dual language learner resources. They're training a, <coughs> sorry. They're training a master cadre of trainers to go out around the state and help teachers as they support and teach um, dual language learners. They'll also be creating a correspondence document between their um, early English language standards and our gels so that teachers will also be able to use that as a resource. Um, then lastly, we're going to be developing some online content um, that will be used as a resource to enhance professional development opportunities to teachers. We know that in this day and age, blended learning is you know, the key to helping um, teachers get access to training. So that blend of face-to-face -face and online training is the way that we wanted to go this, and so we have this online learning library, and so through the grant, we'll be able to enhance that more and provide more um, learning courses and modules on there. So, I just give everybody a little glimpse at the work that we've already gotten done since January with the gels. We have worked with GP to film these gels, 30 second spots that are airing, really targeted towards families and family home providers who are watching GPD TV with children at home to get their awareness up about the gels and hopefully drive them to the website so that they can get more information. So here's one of the 12 spots that will air over the next year. They will rotate in and out over the next year, different times of the day, and each spot focuses on a different skill from the early learning and development standards.
coordinator. Thank you, Laura. Good afternoon, everyone. I know family engagement, particularly during this critical early year, has been to have a profound impact on student success in school and life. And DECAL will very much value family engagement and recognizes it as a quality, a key indicator in quality care across early education programs in the state. So our goal with this project, our goal with this project is to increase the knowledge and use family engagement principles, strategies, and parenting support throughout the state with a particular focus on the early education empowerment systems where I talked about earlier. And so the key strategies will be implemented through um, system reform as well through um, efforts across the state. And so some of the strategies we'll be using is to review quality rated program standards for cultural and linguistic appropriateness and along with best practices in family engagement family connection collaborative and community partners on family engagement tools and strategies. And we'll be providing community-based grants to embed family engagement strategies into local plans. So in fall of 2014, actually kicking off next month, we'll be bringing together a diverse group of stakeholders that will include early education providers, other um, representatives from state agencies, nonprofit organizations, and families, um, to name a few, to uh, establish the principal values and strategies to guide statewide family engagement efforts. This will also look closely at quality rated standards that title same partnership to ensure it aligns with what the task force identifies as effective family engagement practices and that it aligns with what we identify as the outcomes we want for children and families. Also, in 2015, we'll be launching a campaign that's focused on the city family's protective factor, knowledge of parenting and child development. From, for those of you who don't know, the Strengthening Families Approach is a nationally recognized framework that aims to build family strength and family environment the most optimal child development. So the underlying tenet of this campaign is that an understanding of parenting strategies and child development helps families know what to expect and provide the support they need as they grow. As they grow, excuse me. So it shows George Family Connection Partnership, um, which is a nonprofit, public-private intermediary, and its local collaborative to serve as a vehicle to build the capacity of communities to effectively engage families. Deliver four regional trainings across Georgia, two local collaboratives, and the community partners. The part will be agencies that provide supports and services to families with children with disabilities, as well as families um, who have children who are dual language learners. So, we will introduce strategies to effectively engage families, other families, and provide tools and resources families can use and implement in the daily routine. In years, CCAL will distribute non-competitive grants to family connection collaboratives and community partners in the three Zs to set family engagement strategies, with our intent into existing community plans. In addition, DECAL will award 40 competitive grants to collaboratives and partners to do the same. And we'll hand it over to Carol. Thank you, Stacey. As you can see, we're all about communities, and we're all about helping the families in our communities because we realized that um, that's been a thing that we needed to work on in our agency. So I want to talk with you about another project. It's center-based home visiting. But before I talk about the center-based home visiting, I want to provide some background about Great Start Georgia because we're going to use the Great Start Georgia framework and expand it 
in our early education empowerment zones, and then look at how we might be able to scale it up across the state. Grow Georgia provides a framework for expected parents and families with young children under age five to allow them and connect them to community resources to promote the health and school readiness and family health and economic self-sufficiency. Make Start Georgia services include developmental screening, referrals, and community home visiting services. Visiting services are voluntary. Families that choose to participate in home visiting programs receive advice, they receive uh, referrals, and they receive guidance from um, development professionals and others. Um, visiting um, uses an evidence-based approach. You may have heard of Families as Teachers or Healthy Families Georgia. And these are evidence-based approaches that are used in, in communities that have home visiting right now. The Early Learning Challenge Grant allows us to build on the success of Great Start Georgia. So in the Early Education Empowerment Zones, we will partner with child care programs to actually pilot home-based visiting through the program. So what it means is there will be activities to engage all families who use that child care program. There will also be services for all children in the program, as well as the opportunity for voluntary home visits for eligible families and sources for teachers. Engagement activities for all families in the center are to build the community and also to provide opportunities for families to participate in educational activities and include parent cafes or community events like health fairs or field days. Um, all of the children in the child care program will be able to benefit from developmental screening. We help monitor the child's development, helps identify any delays, and more importantly, helps link that family when the child has what may be suspected as a developmental delay or issue to the services so that those services can be um, used to address what the problem is as soon as possible. Center based um, home visitors then may be able to provide services to that family when those developmental delays are identified. Um, may be eligible for home visiting using one of the evidence based models that I mentioned, such as Parents as Teachers or Families America. And this pilot, new parents and families of young children paired with professional home visitors who deliver interventions, provide education, and referral services. It could be done in the child's home, but with this um, center-based model, it might be provided in the child care center as well. So address parent and child interaction, child development, maternal and child health, um, parent education, and again, connections to other community-based services. Teams and staff get support. They receive a lot of information. And then they have a place to refer a family. We think that there's something going on that the family may be able to benefit from additional services. Um, we are really excited to be able to roll this out in the early education empowerment zones in collaboration with Great Start Georgia exciting model to try out, and we hope that it will work so that we can look at scaling it up in other parts of the state. So I will now turn it over to Georgia Thomas. Beryl. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. I'm Georgia Thomas. I'm the professional development manager here. I'll be talking with you about two projects, two projects that focus primarily on our workforce here in Georgia. And it, the two projects were developed in response to the question, how will Georgia build a great workforce? And you know that we didn't have to respond to this. This wasn't a mandatory response question, but we chose to respond to it. And we did so because we thought we had a great story to tell here in Georgia. 
We did so because we thought that we had done some really incredibly solid foundational work that looked at how we prepare our professionals, looked at our expectations to them, and looked at how we support our workforce here in Georgia. So uh, one of the first projects is based on workforce knowledge and competency. Okay. And I was talking to a group of people on last week and said to them that I really think that this project, which we call Project 9, and you'll see that reference there, 20 years ago. That's back in 1994 when a group of stakeholders, some of you may be in the room, I don't want to date anybody, and also, but I'm sure there are people out there listening and watching who were part of this original group. The group of stakeholders decided that if we're to consider ourselves as a profession, then we really need to establish some standards for ourselves. If we're expecting the world to see us as not just babysitters, then we really need to sit down and establish what it is that anyone who's working with young children needs to know, what do they need to be able to do, and what are the ethical kind of principles that will guide their work with young children. So um, in 1994, they did just that. They established our first competencies, and thus was born our Georgia Professional Development Competencies, which is what you see, what you're familiar with. So they developed the competencies around three different roles, roles in early care and education professionals, school aid caregivers, and program administrators. Significant as that work was in the beginning, what I think was really visionary and was really astonishing what they also made a commitment at that time that we will periodically revisit our competencies. We want to know if they're relevant. We want to know uh, do they really reflect and align with the latest research and best practices. And the first time they did that was in 2006. In 2006, they decided that they would add some support roles. What are the competencies that a TA provider needs? What competencies should a trainer have? And they also added levels of competence so anyone who's looking at the standards, looking at the competencies could say, where am I on this continuum? Am I getting levels or am I at a more advanced level? I, as I said, that took quite a bit of vision. Forward. Here we are in 2014 and with the Early Learning Challenge Grant, we have an opportunity now to revisit the competencies again. So in the next several years, We'll be looking to make sure we'll be very focused on what we want to accomplish. We want to sure that our competencies will align with the Georgia Learning and Development Standards that arrived in 2013. Because we think that the children are served best within the context of their communities, their cultures, and their families, we'll add a home visit to family support role as well. And specifically try to address the competencies that are required to work and to serve children who are culturally, ability, and linguistically diverse. So I need children that you've heard us reference a couple of times today in working with young children. At the end of the day, we will have a, a workforce and knowledge competency framework that promotes learning and development and improves outcomes for all of Georgia's children. The second focus under our workforce initiatives will be how are we supporting early educators? And supporting early educators, of course, the main goal is that we want to <coughs> their knowledge, their skills, and their abilities. So one of the things that we'll be doing is looking at how we can expand access to quality professional development opportunities. That occurs through our scholarships programs that provide support for academic pursuits, or be through some of the avenues that Laura Evans mentioned earlier. Peer um, training hierarchy, it could be through mentoring and coaching that's included there, it could be for peer to peer coaches. Second, we want to look at what are the policies that we as a department can look at and implement that might encourage people to consider professional growth and development. Perhaps there are ways to incentivize people through salary and wage compensation. What programs can we put in place that would continue to promote that? And I want to increase the number of early educators who do earn credentials. And of course, since we've done work in the other projects in those competencies, we want those competencies reflected in the credentials that are awarded throughout the state as well. And I did mention uh, in the earlier project that one of the things that we'll be doing is talking to institutions of higher ed, 
that as they are preparing the next generation of early care educators, they will know about our competencies, they will know about our gels, and that will be a part of their learning process. Uh, one of the things that we're able to do as a result of the Early Learning Challenge Grant is we can now award early educators in a very, in a different way. It's a way of acknowledging this achievement, and it is an achievement, for those practitioners who are working in the field currently. We will be able to provide an award for credentials that they earn. We have three levels that they can progress through, um, starting at a first level, which awards $1,200. Up to a third level, as you see, that would award $2,500 for a bachelor's degree in early childhood and child development or a master's degree. L applicants, of course, must earn their credential between the time of the grant. The grant started this calendar year, and we will be awarding these um, rewarding credentials through June 30th of 2017. While we can't go into all of the explicit uh, details about the requirements, you can find the requirements on this website, www.decapscholars.com. Okay? And uh, we thank you for your help in getting us through this place. As I said, I think that we have a huge story to tell, and it has direct a bearing on your participation as stakeholders. So don't wait. Stay tuned. We're still going to need your expertise, so we'll be calling many of you in this room and many of you who are out there listening. Thank you. And I'm going to turn it over now to our inclusion coordinator, Ms. Jenny Kutcher. Yep. Good afternoon. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Georgia. Don't we have some exciting stuff going on? I'm really thrilled with the fact that our state has earned this grant and the fact that we have so many fabulous projects going on. And of course, the most fabulous of all is our comprehensive. <laughs> <laughs> um, we really think this is a great opportunity for our state to take a look at what we're doing in assessment in early childhood here. In Georgia. Um, our Early Learning Challenge Grant defines assessment in sort of two big buckets. One is child level assessment, so including developmental screening, formative assessment, and the other is assessment of classroom climate, so quality of the environment in the classroom and quality of teacher interactions. Um, we know that all of that is extremely important, but we felt like we might get the most impact if we focused on child-level assessment. So we're going to be looking at developmental screening, making sure that our state has systems in place that will identify children who need additional support early, and that there is a system for referring those folks to the services that they need. And formative assessment, do our teachers have the kind of skills they need in order to use informal and formal formative assessments to measure children? children's progress and to guide instruction for children. So we know already that we've got lots of, of good stuff going on in our state. So we're really focused on, on systems building. Um, and to that end, we want to bring people together who have expertise and the knowledge to really put their heads together to figure out how to build a better, more unified system here in our state. So then we are grouping all of our work under the umbrella of a comprehensive assessment system task force. Now, this task force is a joint effort between Department of Public Health and Department of Early Care and Learning, and it's co-chaired by Dr. Suma Sima Sukas, who is the um, Maternal Child Health Unit Director at Department of Public Health and myself. It's going to be made up of representatives. Some of you in this room have already received your invitation to meet with us in September. Uh, those folks are folks from Department of Education, Early Invention, our um, medical system. So we're including people from uh, the Georgia chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics and our family um, practice group. We're including people from behavioral health. We're including folks from higher ed. So we have representatives on our task force from our four-year colleges and universities, our technical system, and also the Board of Regents. So pulling together
together a more diverse group of people than we usually include on some of these early childhood task force so that we can make sure that everybody has an interest in this is able to make their thoughts known. Now, as I said, the task force has already been formed. We're looking forward to our kickoff meeting in September. Task force is going to work over a period of a couple of years. And they're really looking at lots of different questions related to assessment here in Georgia. So when you're thinking about developmental screening, we want to think about who is screening in Georgia. What kinds of tools and techniques are they using? What, what groups of children are being screened or not screened? Um, how are the results being used and communicated to families? And, and most importantly, are all those efforts really connected? An informative assessment. Do teachers use formative assessment? What kinds of tools and practices are available to them? What kind of training and support do we give them? Um, and I think most importantly, are there policy issues that we need to address? Policies that might more effectively support sharing of information and reduce duplication. So another area that we're going to have is around professional development. We know that. There's a lot going on. We have a lot of good tools available already. So, for instance, the, the task force is considering how will we use the new toolkit that our federal partners have created. I don't know if you all are aware of this, but it's called Birth to Five, Watch Me Thrive. And the toolkit with compendiums of information for lots of different partners a broader range of partners than we usually think of in our early childhood. There, there are tools for medical professionals, for community leaders, as well as the usual uh, players in early childhood. So we want to know, we want to think about how we can use those great, great resources to support our teachers and our families out there. And last but not least, we want to consider tools that we will be able to use to support our families. Families really understand the development, and they know how to monitor the, pro monitor the progress of their child's development. Most importantly, do they have the tools that they need in order to share that developmental information with the professionals that support their children? So this task force to generate recommendations that are going to result in state-level policy changes they're going to allow us to build a more effective, unified system of assessment so that things, outcomes will be better for children and families. I'm going to introduce Melissa Fincher from the Department of Education. The department is very pleased to be working with DECAL in the development of a kindergarten entry assessment. And you may know that Georgia currently has a kindergarten assessment, which is formative. It's called the Georgia Kindergarten Inventory of Developing Skills, or GIS, because we have too. Um, <laughs> we have cute acronyms. And so what we're going to do is take this opportunity to really augment GKIDS with this entry assessment. Look at skills that are very important to position students for success in their kindergarten year because that is such a critical gateway year. So we'll be working um, to identify those concepts and skills that students um, we need to know what their baseline is when they enter within the first six weeks so that instruction can be informed through that. We're partnering with DECAL, but importantly, we'll be partnering with pre-K teachers, kindergarten teachers, and first grade teachers to guide everything that we do to make sure that uh, what we're doing is developmentally appropriate for our youngest learners. We want to be naturalistic. This is not the type of assessment where we would ask you to clear your desk and get out your number two pencils. Um, but we could measure, the, in that case, would be the number of wiggles per minute, probably, with five-year-olds. Um, don't know how much information that would be, but we really want uh, it naturally occur in the classroom as instruction is taking place. Something that can consist of um, indirect measures, such as a series of observational tools a teacher may use, direct measures, maybe tasked with large group or individual students um, that teachers can check off different skills. And it will be very similar 
refer to the working, um, the work sampling system that DECAL currently uses. So the purpose is, the, the entire purpose is to position students to be successful and help kindergarten teachers individualize that instruction. We all want to provide feedback to the pre-K programs on how their students are forming as they enter kindergarten so that can inform some of the professional development opportunities that you've heard of uh, being discussed earlier today. And again, just to inform the state in general about how our youngest learners are, are, are doing, how they're entering the K-12 system, and just informing um, our overall educational initiatives throughout the state as well. So we're going to be launching this work very soon. It's a very aggressive timeline. We're going to be field testing our protocols and our task in pre-K classrooms as well as kindergarten classrooms over the next several years. With that, I'll turn it over to DECAL's uh, Chief Information Officer, Craig Dell. I know this is the part of the presentation you've been waiting for. <laughs> um, I will say that my colleagues over here, when I say that, they say in somewhat condescending tone of voice that I never use on our early learning population. <laughs> Not people care about the data systems, they care about the last project. And they get <laughs> question about their project. So, uh, but Sarah did tell me that we're ahead of schedule and I can take the next 20 minutes. <laughs> so, um, this, is, uh, this in the grant was called Unified Data Systems. Uh, the purpose of this in the grant was to build and enhance early learning data systems to improve instruction practices, services, and policy. There are three activities, and I use the term activities kind of loosely. When I think of an activity, having worked with Laura on the gels, I think of a, a, a kind of a fun educational opportunity that you would use in a classroom. Uh, these may be fun, but they are hardly little. Uh, these are some fairly major initiatives. So we have three activities in addition to the data needs that, of all these other projects. The first is to expand the cross-agency child data system. The second is to uh, create a provider self-service module. And the third is to complete our professional development data system with a training registration system. So I want to talk briefly about each of those. Cross-agency child data system uh, is housed here at DECAL. And what it does is allow us to understand which children are participating in which programs. And that helps with policy and that helps with program integrity. Additionally, we tie into the Georgia Awards, the state launched to P20 longitudinal data system. So we're able to see how uh, different programs affect child outcomes as they move to the education system. So then affords us the opportunity to add additional data sources, and are mostly data sources uh, with children with high needs. So we have things like babies can't wait, special ed data, home visitation data, and some other things that you can see up here on the screen. Part of this project is a data governance structure, and we're fortunate we have Chris Alia, who's sitting in the back, uh, who has come over from the P20 Georgia Awards uh, Constitutional System, but uh, is helping us set that up, and that will have representation from all the various agencies that are contributing data, uh, and it's important that we want to be sure we adhere to state and federal requirements around privacy and security. This project or activity, fun activity, uh, is a child care provider self-service module. And the purpose of this is to ease some of the administrative burden on the child care providers. So I'm going to go through all the things. If you're a child care provider, you know what a lot of these things are. I'm not going to go through all these, but I would pay attention to the second one. Some of the things we want to do, uh, site information updates. Uh, we want to uh, allow child care providers to upload uh, pictures about their center so they can go online and take a virtual tour of the center. Also part of this is to make a lot of this mobile in a mobile uh, access. Uh, also part of this is enhancing the data collection done by the child resource and referral agencies. Um, we will have a portal for them, for them to uh, enter data directly into the system. And ultimately what we want to do is collect a lot more detailed information so that we can provide that to the public so that parents and caregivers, if they look for child care providers, uh, have much more information to meet their unique needs. The little activity is the training registration system, and this will help us finish, complete our professional development data system. Right now, teachers, when they take state-approved training, uh, get a certificate at the end of the training, and for that to uh, get credit in the 
professional development registry, they have to send that certificate into the Professional Standards Commission. We verify it, scan it, in, and uh, then they show it's having for that. One system will allow us for teachers to enroll online or providers to enroll online, trainers to, man trainers to manage rock <laughs> and the trainers can mark that uh, training has been completed and the teachers and providers don't have to go through that whole process and send all their uh, material in for verification. That will all ha happen seamlessly. It will allow providers and teachers um, uh, add to a statewide training calendar of all state approved training. The left is going to help increase our understanding of what and where trainings are offered. So we've made a lot of progress the past few years on our on our summer data systems here at the agency, and we're able to track violations and citations and accidents and injuries, and we can bump that data up against our training registration data and make sure that trainings are being offered throughout the state to meet some of those needs that we're seeing in our in our licensing and quality rated systems. So those are the three um, fun little with our data systems. And now I believe I'm turning it over to back to our Deputy Commissioner Kristen. Okay. <laughs> we'll answer questions. Grant, you're here in person. Again, if you'll fill out your comment card and go back in the red jack is going to be collecting them. We have some real overachievers, though. Um, I actually started receiving questions this morning, 9 a.m. on email. Uh, so I'm so glad that people have taken the time to read our website or you begin emailing them in. So just raise your hand with your question card. Sarah will come and pick it up. And I'll start on the three that I got online before this session started. The first, actually, can invite Craig to come back up here to so the question. Um, specifically, Craig, this is a provider who wanted to know about the timeline for some of the provider self-service activities. It talks about when if some of those are going to be coming online or when there might be opportunities to be participating in field testing for those. Absolutely. We are going to engage, uh, any, and if you're interested, please let me know any number of providers to help uh, as we go through the development of this. The schedule for this is after the license fee pays for this year, which typically ends in, in February, uh, for those that are stragglers in February. Uh, we hope to roll the SIM out to allow fee payments online and, and updated information online. And then um, I guess we can go back to here. So the very first thing, fee payments and enforcement fine payments will be able to do, be done online starting in February. Uh, that will mean back next uh, November, people will be able to start doing pay, fee payments online. And they have a rollout schedule through the next year to two years over these next features. So I don't know if that specific enough, but if you're interested in the specifics, I'd be happy to talk to you more about that. Another question online before we start to the ones that were in the room, and it's one that I'll answer real quick. And the, the question was, are there plans to require degrees for working in child care classrooms other than pre-K as an additional means to quality improvement? As you heard Georgia Thomas describe, we're really looking at how can we incent teachers in the early child setting to go and get that advanced degree through positive incentives. Things like the awards for early educators and the other programs that you can find at decalscholars.com are really where we're focusing that in increasing the credential attainment of our early childhood workforce. So that's really our primary push with this grant is what sort of incentives to support, reward, and retain high quality, highly effective educators in our earliest classrooms right now. So we're looking in Georgia that we've added additional degree requirements for lead teachers in some of our classrooms, and we're really looking at how can can we use positive reinforcements to further increase the educational attainment of our workforce? So one question from online, which was directed towards Pam, so I'll have her come up here. And this is a question specific about uh, what are the incentives that are available for providers to join the quality rate system? Question. So when you uh, decide to be part of quality rate, and the first thing that happens if you decide to go um, and work with your child care resource and referral agency to get technical Assistance, you get $1,000 in materials to help you move towards a higher rating. So that means that your technical assistance uh, provider will come in and do a baseline uh, for us to see what you need and where you are and help you order materials to support your work. Then after you're rated, depending on if you're one, two, or three star program, you get these great bonus packages that um, you have a choice with them. They're different. Depending on the star rating and depending on your individual needs, um, these are packages like 
between like four thousand six thousand dollars so that's to make a difference in a child care center the cool thing to me is at the level three if you're a three-star program your um teachers get a bonus for them their classroom not by wiggly eyes you know actually for them for their hard work and achieving such a, a huge goal and the directors get a bonus as well and Pam, I have you go too far away, but we'll have Laura come up, I think, for this one, but it might be Pam as well. Um, question is, how can a subsidy grant be used as a tool for dual-generation dual strategies that connect parents to work and training while maintaining stability for families and for programs? Is that the easier you can see I'll have you? Yeah, I think that um, the subsidy grants are, are really trying to make sure that families who maybe didn't consider um, enrolling in a, in a child development program. So you may have a family member who's not at work who hasn't considered that. And now here that there's some real importance about a child engaging in high quality education. And that subsidy a dollar amount helps them get closer to what the true cost of quality is, which could really be the, 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 the lever to push a parent to say, you know what? I can now afford high quality early care education so I can go to school or I can enter the workforce. In the empowerment zones, we're going to work very closely with the Department of Labor to look at um, apprenticeship programs. We're going to really think of this birth to workforce pipeline to help families get aligned to technical college institutions, um, training courses. And again, that subsidy program really allows a, fa a family member to say, now you can do this. And there's, again, those online to email in questions. I'll put email address back up on the screen. As well, we'll have a few more that are here in person. Again, just raise your hand with your question if you want Sarah to come around and get it. George Thomas, if you come towards the front, we have a couple of questions about awards for early educators, which is understandable because it is a very popular program and a great new addition to the resources that DECAL provides for our workforce. A few questions. They all kind of hit on the same issues around the eligibility for this program. So looking at awards for early educators, is it only tied to teachers or is it also tied to the length of time with the provider? And then are these particular practical awards, I think we're talking about the awards for educators, uh, a one-time or provide on an annual basis? Georgia, can you hit that? Uh, so indeed, great questions. Uh, for the first question, yes, there are some requirements, and I can tell from the question that some of you are familiar with our incentives program, which definitely is tenure-based, and it is designed to help us retain our workforce, as we alluded earlier. Uh, we require in that program that someone be in place in their same position, <laughs> same program, for at least 12 consecutive months. But the news for early, for awards early educators is that there's a three-month tenure. It is open to not only teachers, but assistant teachers, directors, and assistant directors. And the second question was? Uh, is it one-time or multiple? Okay, it is a one-time award. What we hope is that people will progress through the different levels. They'll start perhaps at the first level. Maybe they've had an opportunity to return to uh, participate in a community-based CDA training. They can get awarded for earning that CDA at $1,200. They can take that CDA, go to one of Georgia's technical colleges, have that CDA converted into nine hours that could then fold into a technical college diploma, which is the next level, and that level is awarded at $1,500. And finally, they can also get a third payment at the third level of $2,500 if they earn a bachelor's degree or a master's degree. So questions keep coming for Georgia, the awards program for Georgia. So what about uh, pre-K teachers or people who are employed in a board of education uh, pre-K classroom? Are they eligible for some of our incentives? Okay. Well, again, the good news is, is because we have this funding now that we were able to expand the eligibility uh, to pre-K assistant teachers. Um, and also lead teachers who actually earn an award. So yes, they will be eligible to participate in this. This is an early learning challenge grant, so we want to focus on those professionals that work with zero to five and, of course, our four-year-olds in pre-K. I've all the Georgia Awards questions. I've seen any more come in on my email. But in decalscholars.com contains the full eligibility requirements for the tuition, 
scholarship and salary and supplemental programs that DECAL administers. There are a host of resources on there both to access those awards as well as to find information about mentoring and coaching to find the right degree program to see which level a teacher should come in on. And that's full first through five spectrum. While Carol Hartman is coming towards the front, uh, we have some questions about Great Start Georgia and the home visiting governance. That's a really exciting expansion of a program that's already happening in the state. But the specific question, Carol, was regarding the governance of the program. What agencies are involved in administering that? Um, Great Start Georgia, which is um, a collaboration between the Department of Health and the Department of Human Resources, and right from the start are overseeing it. Um, the Great Start Georgia framework is overseen um, now at the Department of Human Resources, so the group will be providing um, the oversight. They will also be um, working in the communities that are selected as the early education empowerment zones to choose um, and work with that community to decide on the home visiting model as well as the agency that will receive um, the home visiting contract. Well, last call for questions. Just to clarify on that, it's the Department of Human Services. That's the agency. That's okay. Well, we've changed names a lot here, too. It's hard to keep all the acronyms straight at times, as you can see. Uh, but we're excited about the increased partnership between the Department of Early Care and Learning and Human Services to oversee that. I think we've gotten through all the questions. If you have a lingering one about the Early Learning Challenge Grant, please feel free to send me an email or to visit our Early Learning Challenge website, where you sign up for our e-newsletter. I will give you more information about the projects and the work. As you heard, we have a lot of great grant opportunities that will be available both in the Early Education Empowerment Zone, but also throughout the whole state. And we want to keep you informed and updated about when you can access those opportunities and who in your communities might be the best people to have at the table to take advantage of those resources. We're always available to answer questions, though, and we'll be sticking around here in person for those of you here. And please keep checking our website to find out about additional opportunities to stay up to date on the work in Georgia's Early Learning Challenge Grant. Thank you all so much. <laughs>